Hey guys, thanks for clicking on the video thumbnail for lasered louvers here at Next Level Carpentry so I can show you just what the heck lasers have to do with louvers. And I'm sure you're aware from hundreds if not thousands of videos out there on YouTube that lasers are making a strong push into the world of woodworking. But from my observation, at least 90% of those videos are geared towards entry-level engraving and light fabrication on craft projects and hobby projects that are kind of geared towards sales on Etsy or art in the park. And I'm not knocking that level of creative activity, but I do want to show the next level carpentry audience that state-of-the-art lasers like X-Tools P2 55 watt CO2 laser are capable of much more than simple engraving of coasters and tumblers or light fabrication for puzzles and Christmas ornaments. So I'll take you on a deep dive where I use the P2's powerful 55 watt laser to cut 162 mortises for the 81 louvers on this project that I'm doing for a discerning client. And I want to focus more on the work that the laser does to make this project possible than to cover the more routine woodworking aspect of a build like this. So I'm going to jump right in and breeze through the process I used for making the frames that these lasered panels fit into. And then I'll slow the pace a little bit to get into the nitty gritty of what it takes to get next level results from a CO2 laser on a project like this. So fasten your seatbelt as I fast forward through preparation of stock for these louver panel frames. After rough sizing, flattening, and thickness planing pieces for the louver frames, I flip them on edge and plow a dado one inch wide and one eighth inch deep on one edge of each piece. Making the dado in two passes guarantees that it's centered up in the edge, which is essential for the success of this project. The next step is to cut bridle joints on the frame pieces, starting with mortises on each end of the side pieces. After cutting them to their finished length of 32 and a half inches, I use an auxiliary fence on a miter guide to cut those slot mortises a half inch wide and around two inches deep in multiple passes. Here again, to make sure the mortise is centered up in the piece and checking the final slot width with a fractional dial caliper to verify the width. Because of the dados in the edges of side pieces, I start the process of cutting tenons on top and bottom pieces by making a small notch in each face on each end. This allows me to make step tenons for the bridle joints that will make these louver frames super strong and easier to assemble. After cutting those small notches, I reset the blade and fence and make deeper secondary tenon cuts for the stepped tenons. With both of the stepped tenon cuts made on both ends of all the top and bottom pieces, I use the same auxiliary fence on the miter guide plus a height extension on the rib fence to make cheek cuts on these step tenons. For this step, I just flip the piece between cuts so that the tenons are guaranteed centered up on these pieces too. After I finish cutting all the slot mortises and stepped tenons, I use a rubber mallet for an initial dry fit of the joints on all three louver frames before moving on to the next phase of the build. Once the joinery on all three of the frames was done, I went back through the milling steps of flattening, straightening, and ripping to create this pile of slats here that are all exactly one inch wide and three eighths of an inch thick. And these slats are sized to fit into the dado groove on the inside edges of each of the framed openings where they drop down one eighth inch into that dado groove and stick out a quarter of an inch here in a little added edge detail that'll set off the louvers in a frame. And I made slats to fit in the top and bottom as solid pieces and the longer pieces will get mortised for the louver slats that fit in between the sides of the frame. And all of the steps up to this point in the video are routine, albeit somewhat advanced millwork, but this is where I venture off into uncharted territory and use my 55 watt P2 laser by X-Tool to mortise these strips to accept the ends of the louver slats. And although the laser is capable of a great deal of precision, like within a couple thousandths of an inch, I'm still working with real wood, which is prone to movement, as you can see in a couple of these slats here. These are the exact same width and thickness, but they've got a little bit of a bow in them. And I don't want to program the laser to follow the curvature of these pieces, so I'm going to create a fixture that I'll use to hold these slats uh, perfectly straight so that everything comes out consistent when I burn those mortises through these slats. And as with any good fixture, this one's going to serve more than one purpose. So although the first function is to hold the slats straight, 
It'll also hold them oriented at 90 degrees to the gantry inside the laser, which will make more sense later. And it also has to have an alignment function because the slats for the louvers in the side of the frames are longer than the width capacity of the laser. So I've got to route or burn those mortises in in two separate operations, which further justifies the time spent creating the fixture so that I get the accurate and consistent results that I want and need to succeed in making louvers with a laser. And keep in mind as I go through the steps to build this fixture that this is uncharted territory and at least it's uncharted to me. So if something doesn't make sense as you're watching, stick with me as I go through the process. If it doesn't make sense at the end, just re-watch this segment and I think the principles will click. But uh, to start off with, I'm using a piece of three quarter inch plywood. It's pretty flat, but the edges are perfectly parallel and the ends are perfectly square. And I've got these three strips here. I don't know if you can see them in the camera. Uh, two of the strips, or this strip has a rabbit on one side. This one is rabbited on both sides and this is rabbited on the, rabbited on the opposite side. And these three strips are going to hold those uh, slats up off of this piece of plywood so the laser can burn all the way through. So that's one function. But the main function at this stage is that these strips will hold those slats perfectly straight, perfectly parallel to each other at a given distance apart, perfectly parallel to the edges of this piece and at exactly 90 degrees to the end of the piece. So to get that done, I'm just going to start by setting the center one of these strips, which I want to be parallel to one side of this piece of plywood. So I've just got a, another scrap here. Uh, this is half inch Russian birch. It's an arbitrary width. And by placing that against the fence and the plywood against the fence, that makes this piece perfectly parallel to the edge of this piece. And so I want to attach it firmly here as the first step in making the fixture. And the best way I know of attaching this to that is to secure it with screws. And the best way to do that is to first mark out some pilot holes here. This will be the edge of the piece. And so with those marks, I can just drill a couple of holes here. And those hole locations are pretty arbitrary, but spaced near the ends and near the center. The next step is I'll use some of my favorite Starbond CA glue, the accelerator and the medium thick flavor to attach this to that, which I will do by spritzing accelerator in three locations on the bottom of this strip, adding that medium flexible CA to the end near the middle and near the other end. And now I can just make sure everything's up against the fence like that. Line this end up on a mark here that roughly centers this piece on the board and press it for a few seconds to hold it in place. And those simple steps make it super easy to get this piece attached where I want it without a lot of fussing, flipping it over and dealing with screws so that now I can flip the piece over knowing everything is lined up and then use this snappy pilot countersink bit to chase through those holes and countersink the underside of this fixture. And because I know that strip is held firmly in place by the glue and it's perfectly parallel to the edge of the piece, I can hold it there forever and always by driving three inch and a quarter square drive screws through those piloted holes into the underside of the center strip for this fixture. Just like that, boys and girls. Now that that center strip is firmly in place, perfectly straight and perfectly parallel, I can go about locating and attaching the two side pieces. And ironically, these have a bit of a bow in them also, but this process will get everything straightened out so that everything is copacetic. And I'm using a couple of the slats. These are nice and straight to save a little bit of fuss here. So I use that to line up that, this to line up this. I'm just using my hand to hold this together and put a couple of marks out here as guides like that. And now I can go through the same piloting process that I used before. But this time, because the pieces have a little bit of bow in them and I don't want to fuss with that while the CA glue is setting, I just put everything in place, line everything up and use a small squeeze clamp to hold everything in place while I pilot and drive those screws. And this time, because I'm not using CA glue to hold the strips in place, 
I use a couple temporary blocks for spacers underneath so I don't end up with a fracas when I bear down on a drill to pilot the holes and drive the screws. And I think you'd be hard pressed to beat that for speed or accuracy because when everything's screwed in place, the slats slip right out of there. Everything's wonderful. The slats can be placed back in, holding everything perfectly parallel. And it also works when I use the pieces that aren't quite so straight because the blocks are held firmly enough to hold that slat perfectly in place and perfectly straight. Which is the whole purpose of this little fixture in the first place. And now I can go about orienting this fixture in the P2 laser so I can get down to the business of burning some mortises with 55 watts of CO2 laser power. As I already mentioned, if these slats were a little bit shorter, I could just put them in the laser bed going this way. But the width capacity of the P2 laser is just a little less than 27 inches. And wouldn't you know it, the pieces I need are 28 and an eighth. So that's what all this rigmarole is out because I can't just put the slats in that way and let them get cut. I've got to orient them front to back this way. And the laser capacity this way is about 11 inches. So I've actually got to uh, burn those um, mortises in there in three separate stages. But to do it, I've got to put the pieces underneath here and then move them back and forth. And to make sure that all the little mortises are lined up on these narrow slats, I've got to make sure that this piece is absolutely perpendicular to the gantry or to the body of the laser. So I made a little fence for the back end of the jig here or the front end, depending on how you look at it, that'll help register this fixture at 90 degrees to the X axis in the machine. I think I got that right. And another note along these lines, X-Tool does make a conveyor attachment for this laser. I don't have that. They also make a riser attachment, which I don't have. And to tell you the truth, I'm not sure I would trust either one of those uh, setups to be accurate enough for what I need to do here. Maybe they are, and I'm just spinning my wheels with all these extra steps. But the benefit is you can see extra functions of the laser that can be made by MacGyvering a fixture to get more performance out of the laser than the basic laser unit is designed to do. And here's a close up of what this fixture is going to look like. And I'll make a note that when I built this laser cart, I had little riser pegs, little riser feet like this to hold the laser up off the cart. And for this piece to fit underneath here, I already made taller riser feet than this. The ones I have under there now are three inches. And that allows enough room for this to fit underneath. And I need to make sure that this fixture is registered at 90 degrees to the face of the machine, which is parallel to the mechanics inside of it. And I don't want to register it off the cart in case the laser and the cart are misaligned by any amount. So what I did was I squared a line across the end of the fixture here after attaching those blocks. And then I made a fence with a slot in it here that'll slide up like this line up with that square mark and then when it's attached I can clamp it to the front of the laser like this. And the setup of this piece back and forth this way isn't that critical. It's important but it's going to be easy to establish once I'm holding this fixture at 90 degrees to the laser itself. And every laser out there is going to behave a little bit differently. This is pretty specific to the P2 desktop laser and it's also pretty specific to the laser louver project that I'm working on. But I hope it gives you some insight into possibilities for a piece of equipment like this that aren't a mainstream application for the machine or the technology. And I'd encourage you to venture off into uncharted territory with an idea of some of the possibilities that you can come up with based on this unusual application for this particular laser. And with all that said, I'm gonna get this attached in a similar fashion as these other strips. And to make this easy on myself, because nobody else is gonna, I move the pieces over on the table saw so I can use the rib fence for alignment while attaching this fence. And no doubt this process looks familiar by now, where I drill some pilot holes from the top side of the piece next to the orientation line, push the fixture up next to the fence, drop in a piece of scrap of the right width to use for alignment, and then use my favorite Starbond CA glue for initial attachment of the fence to the fixture. 
and adding that simple but accurate fence gets me one step closer to actually burning the slots in these slats for the laser louvers. Because with this auxiliary fence up against the front of the laser, the slats are perfectly perpendicular with the gantry and the rails inside of the machine, which means I can expect accurate results when I program the laser to burn those mortises, regardless of where this fixture is positioned side to side in the machine. The mechanics of this laser are such that the working area is smaller than the actual area in the bed of the laser, so I add red marks at the upper limit so I can make sure to position the slats inside the working area when doing final setup for burning the mortises. After completing this fixture and placing it in the machine and doing some experimenting, I realized there were some things that I didn't understand about getting accuracy out of the P2 laser. So I've done quite a bit of experimenting and test running on burning some of the mortises in some test slats to work my way through the learning curve for getting the results that I want and expect while working within the parameters of the P2 laser and the software that's used for creating the files that the laser burns. So follow me over to the table saw here where I'll show you what I'm talking about. What you see here on the table saw are some of my experiments on burning these louver slots. And I started out with pieces of thin plywood to kind of get things dialed in. And what I realized is that there's a difference between accuracy gained by the cameras that are inside the laser that are used to locate pieces inside the laser bed and dimensions and measurements that are actually built into the file itself using the Creative Space software. And as an overview, um, this piece right here is the scrap that I used, and this file here creates this little mini carpenter's tool tote here. And as you can see, if you look close, all the parts necessary to create three of these cool little tool totes are in this piece of scrap. All the ends, the handles, the bottoms, and the sides are right in there. And I used the optical location inside the laser to position these parts on this piece so that they, all of them fit together on the piece. And every one of these parts uh, is identical. All six sides, all six ends, and all three handles, all three bottoms are identical to each other. But their placement on here is kind of random and arbitrary. And as long as they don't overlap, overlap or hit each other, that's all good. And that's basically the location system that I've used for everything that I've made to this point in time. But now these louver slats are kind of a different thing altogether because each one of these uh, little mortises is identical to each other. And my first attempts to use the fixture in the laser, I just tried to use the optics from uh, the screenshot of the laser bed to place and locate those mortises on these slats. And that proved to be nowhere near accurate enough to get the results that I needed for this. So I had to take some extra measures to guarantee acceptable results. And I'll take you over to the laser to show how I got that done. So I'll bring you back to this view inside the laser with the fixture in place and remind you that the slots in the fixture are perfectly perpendicular to the x-axis inside the laser so that when I put a piece in place, I know that the cuts are going to be all lined up with the edges and these little slots will be centered up in the piece. But I still need to tell the laser where this edge is so it knows where to start cutting. And for simplicity's sake, I want that edge to be exactly at 10 inches. And the laser knows where 10 inches is, but I don't because there's nothing to measure from inside the laser that ends up at 10 inches away. So I need the laser to tell me where 10 inches is so that I can line the fixture up on that mark. And the other thing I need to do is have the laser tell me where zero is up here. The mark I made with a pencil isn't accurate enough because I need to align up to marks within a couple thousandths of an inch. And that red mark itself is a few thousandths of an inch thick. And so through the process of experimentation, I learned that I need to have the laser locate the 10 inch mark and this mark up here, which is 0.25 or a quarter inch in from the X axis in the laser. And I also made another set of marks right here that are eight inches away so that I can mortise these out in eight inch segments. There's three eight inch segments for one of these slats. And then there's one segment at the end that's like four and a half inches long. But I learned it's absolutely essential to have precise marks 
laid out by the laser for the quarter inch mark and another mark eight inches away as well as the 10 inch mark. So I'm going to fire up the tablet here and give you a screenshot of the file I created to print those layout marks on the fixture. So what you're looking at here is the creative space interface and this particular shot shows one section of the louvers. This blue box is nine inches long and from a little mark down here which you probably can't see to the top that's eight inches and I want that to line up inside of the bed of the laser so they can grave the separate sections. Here's the second section, third section, fourth section of the louvers. All those need to line up to make the whole slat come out right. And then this right here is the location file that I created. And it's nothing more than blue lines that are showing up here. And if I select this top line, you can see that one end of the line is at 9.5 inches. The line is a quarter inch down from the top. It's 3.59 inches long. And this line right here is at 10 inches on the x-axis and 0.25 inches to the top end of it on the y-axis. And this line is 11.59 inches or 1.59 inches away from that line on the x-axis. So the first one represents the left side of the left slat and the second one represents the left side of the right slat. And now that the laser is running, the audio is going to be a little messed up because of the fan. But I hope you can see here that this rectangle represents these orientation marks in this file. There's the top line, line eight inches away, and then the four vertical lines that line up with the fixture in the machine. And I already have the fixture lined up exactly at 10 inches, which is this mark right here. But initially I had to place the fixture side to side to get that 10 inch mark to line up. But I'm gonna run this file again. And it'll just trace over the lines that are already on the fixture in the laser. But this should help you understand the layout process that's necessary to get the results that I want from these louvers. So I'll go through the process of firing up the laser to make this happen. By first pressing the process button, then the start button on the tablet, followed by the start button on the laser to initiate this quick burn. And no one has to tell me that that's a pretty weak bit of video and audio, but now that it's reburned this, you know how I got these orientation marks. And I hope you can see them here, the different orientation marks that correspond to the blue lines in the Creative Space software. And the remarkable thing is that I first engraved these many hours ago before doing a whole bunch of experimentation. And you just saw it retrace those original layout lines with astounding accuracy. And when I slide into one of the slats that I just burned, you can see an alignment mark. This is just a small score mark on the actual piece that lines up with this mark. When the top of this X box lines up with that mark, then to do the next segment, I just slide, slide this up till it lines up here. This lines up here and I know everything is perfect the way it needs to be. And that I can get exact mirror image copying of a left and right louver slat using this setup. And I can get it with predictable, consistently accurate results. And now I'll take you back to that stack of slats that I milled earlier in the video and select a couple of them to slip into the fixture so that I can burn those louver slat mortises into them. But first, a word from my sponsor. Wait a second. <laughs> I don't have a sponsor. But you can help me out if you'll consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. It's free, you know. And as a subscriber, you'll be first to know when videos like this and other in-depth, off-in-the-weeds videos from Next Level Carpentry get uploaded. And while you're at it, please hit that thumbs up button with something you have on hand, or if you've got a laser, go ahead and burn that thumb. So it registers as a thumbs up over there at YouTube, and they'll know things are going on here at Next Level Carpentry. And although I don't have an actual sponsor, you can see more about this P2 laser by Xtool if you look at the video linked here that shows the unboxing and review of that laser machine that I did a few months back when I got it from Xtool. And as you'd expect, Check for links in the video description for other tools and supplies you see in use here at the Next Level Carpentry channel. And if this is the sort of content you like enough to advertise it to your friends, check out t-shirts and swag that are available through the link to Spring in the video description where you'll also find some PDF plans for projects that I've done in the Next Level Carpentry shop. So check out the swag there and grab some, which helps provide a little support to the channel, and I always appreciate it. 
And I'll wrap up this infomercial with a shout out to patrons of Next Level Carpentry on Patreon, whose support is a part of the reason I can operate this channel without having to cater to sponsors and say things I don't want to say or I don't mean to support their products or services as a paid sponsor of any of the companies. So if you like what you see here, as, uh, which is what I think of as a relatively low hype approach, consider becoming a patron of the channel so I can keep producing and uploading this sort of video content without as much advertising overburden as other channels of a similar genre here on YouTube. And I'll thank you for anything and everything you do to help support the channel. And hopefully you'll forgive me for the tease I slipped in here ahead of the actual burn of those mortise slots in a couple of these slats. And because the laser has cooling fans that corrupt the audio, I'll make a couple more comments as I'm sliding these into place. And the first thing is that these slats are a few inches longer than they need to end up. And for the first section, I can just slide these into place through the little square opening in this fence and just make sure that they extend past the upper limit mark that I just burned into the fixture with the laser. The other thing I'll say here is that because I'm using this laser in open plane mode, there's no tray in the bottom, so the smoke isn't contained in the cabinet. It literally just blows out the back of the machine, which is why I've turned it around so the smoke blows that way. I can open the shop door and the shop window and the cross ventilation will take the smoke right on out of here. But let me give you one last look inside here before I start the laser and start the burn. And because some of the slats fit a little more loosely than others, I've learned to add a piece of masking tape to hold everything in place so it doesn't move around during the laser process, even though there's virtually no force on any of these parts. And here again, this reference mark is the upper limit of the piece, but because these slats are over length, I've just run this up here about a half an inch or so, and that part will get trimmed off later. But this is what it looks like prior to burning the upper section of the louver mortises in the top end of two slats. And now, with everything in place, I can close the lid, flip the power switch, and let the P2 go through its initialization sequence so it's ready to start the burn. Since I've run this file before, all the parameters and settings are dialed in. And after a quick review, just to make sure everything's in order, I hit process and start on the tablet and the on button on the P2 laser, and it jumps into action to run this file. Once I push the start button on the machine, the P2 jumps into action to burn the file it's programmed to run. It starts off with scoring operations with the X in the box at the top of the slat that meticulously graves the text next level carpentry into the top two louver slat mortises, then finishes up with the other reference X and two small reference marks eight inches down the slats before switching in the burn mode at a full 55 watts of power and four millimeters per second to cut the actual mortises in these slats. Naturally, I've sped up this part of the video because watching a laser burn is slightly more interesting than watching paint dry, but it takes a little less than 20 seconds to burn each one of the mortises on each of these slats. Because this is wood and has natural inconsistencies, you can see the blank in some of the cutout mortises literally falls out of the piece when the burn is complete, but other ones stick and lodge in place, held there by a few charred fibers on the underside of the piece. In this view, you can see the laser head at work, where it looks more like a flamethrower as the laser beam burns through a full 3 8 of an inch thickness of solid soft maple as it cuts those mortises and generates a considerable cloud of smoke in the process. When the burn is complete, the lid of the laser stays locked for 10 or 15 seconds to clear smoke from the cabinet, so I can't open it just yet, but you can see on the screen of the tablet that section one on the top end of these louver slats took five minutes and 54 seconds to burn. And once the lid is unlocked, you can see the results. To prepare for the next stage of the burn, I clean out all the little teeth so I don't start a campfire in my laser and spritz both slots in the fixture with water in an effort from starting a conflagration while I burn the rest of the mortises in these slats. And with that bit of housekeeping taken care of, I slide both of the slats back into the slots in the fixture, lighting up the scored index mark from the first section for proper alignment when burning the second. And at the risk of redundancy, I'll stress again that accuracy and alignment are critical for the results I want to get in this process. So I tap the slats until the reference lines are perfectly aligned before running the next section of the file. And now it's lather, rinse, repeat. As I go back to the laptop, switch to section number two, check the settings, 
and initiate the start process to burn another batch of mortises in the slats. And now, when the laser starts, you'll see it quickly run the scoring steps first before running the slow but still mighty fast process of burning those mortises in this 3 8 inch thick maple. And after another smoky session, 5 minutes and 48 seconds long, the first two sections are burned on these laser slats and I can reset for section number 3. It's remarkable to me that the third section takes the exact same 5 minutes and 48 seconds it took to burn the second section. And now that it's complete, I reset the slats for the fourth and final burn, which should take 2 minutes and 50 seconds. Like I said, burn time, 2 minutes, 50 seconds. And that, ladies and gentlemen, completes the burn on two of the six slats I need for these three louvered panels. And a short dozen of useless but kind of cool scraps engraved with the Next Level Carpentry logo. Once smoke from the laser clears from the shop, I go back into regular woodworking mode by lining up reference marks on the end of the two louver slats and hold them in alignment with a short piece of frog tape. Then take the two slats to the miter saw where I trim the ends to the reference marks burned into the slats by the laser. And I do admit it's a unique experience to use a laser to mark these pieces for length because essentially what I'm doing is using a $4,000 laser as a tape measure. But I think you'll agree that the means justify the ends because in the end these laser mortised louver strips slip nicely into the dados plowed into the side of the frames early on in the video. And I can finish this stage of the build by marking blank slats to length, carefully cutting them on the miter saw and slipping them into place in the dados in the tops and bottoms of the frames to hold the mortised strips snugly in place and complete the edge profile around the inside perimeter of the frames. Now with all three of these frames completed to this stage, I'll shift into full-on millwork mode and convert this pile of soft maple blocks into 81 slats, 3 16 of an inch thick, an inch and a half wide, and 13 inches long with thumbnail profiles on both of the edges. And I can tell you, that is going to create some guy glitter. The first step is to flatten one face of each chunk of 8 quarter inch thick soft maple on my Powermatic PJ882 joiner, where the helical head quickly removes irregularities in this rough milled stock. Next, I use a series of passes through my DeWalt DW735 thickness planer to true up the other face of each chunk to rough thickness. After that, it's back to the joiner where I plane one edge of each piece perfectly square to its faces and then take them over to the table saw where I rip a whole stack of slats to rough thickness. Before thickness planing these slats, I quickly draw squiggle marks on one face and a straight line on the other. These lines add a reliable visual reference to keep faces organized during the planing process so I can make sure saw marks are planed off all faces. I first run all these pieces through the thickness planer until all the squiggle marks are gone from one face, then flip stacks of slats over, top for bottom and end for end, before finishing up with a final pass on the opposite face that removes the straight lines and leaves the pieces at the exact right thickness of 3 16 of an inch, and a test fit in a laser louver mortise tells me I'm ready for the next step. Now that I've got a whole stack of slats that are the exact right thickness for the louvers in these panels, the next task at hand is to shape these into louvers that are the exact same width as that mortise with edges that match the profile of the mortise. And I can about guarantee you that every louver you've ever seen had slats with a full bullnose profile on the edges or an angled profile depending on how the louver is made. But observant viewers will notice that the profile on the sides of these mortises are unique to Next Level Carpentry in this video and that they're not a bullnose but a thumbnail profile. And so the challenge at this stage is to make these slats to the exact right size for a snug fit in those mortises. And I'm going to go over to the whiteboard and talk about that shape for a second. And I admit that this is a pretty subtle detail, but 
The simplest louvers have angled edges because they're made with mortises that go all the way through a piece, and then the slats just have beveled edges that match up with the angle of the dados. And that's the simplest way to just cut grooves through a piece with a dado blade, but then those slats have sharp edges because of the angle. And to get around that, most louvers that you see have bullnose edges because the mortises for them are made with a router bit. So whatever the thickness of the slat is, that's made with a router bit or a CNC bit. And so the ends of those mortises have a full half round circle on them. So that's very common, but because I'm taking a next level approach to this project, I decided to go with a little bit different twist on this in that I want the slats to have thumbnail edges versus angled or bullnose. And the difference is because I'm making these mortises and these louvers with a laser, I can make the shape on the end of those slats anything I want. And what I chose to do is go with an eighth inch radius on a 3 16 inch slat. And this is way out of scale. But that's why you saw the laser cutting mortises that are shaped like this. Maybe I can do a better job. So rather than a full bullnose profile, it's a radius like this that ends in two distinct lines on the edges of those slats. And to me, that adds kind of a distinct modern touch to this, a modern feel, because it's unique for one thing, but it still has a smooth look and feel to it. Uh, with the laser, obviously, I could have easily made uh, rectangular mortises. I could have made mortises with a little diamond point on the end, any shape I want because of the laser that gives me options that a dado blade and a router bit don't. But part of this decision is the difficulty of making these louvers with that profile in the exact width that fits the mortises burned in by the laser. But I didn't take you this far along the path to abandon you now, so I'll show you how I get this done. And because this process is both new to the world and new to me, I went through the gears to build a setup for putting that thumbnail profile on the edges of these thin slats as a proof of concept. And what you're looking at here is the setup I came up with. And because I'm doing about 90 slats, a little over a foot long, I'll be profiling almost 200 lineal feet of slat edges with that thumbnail profile. So the jig has to be not only consistent, but efficient. And I think you'll agree that this setup is both. But since I've already made the fixture, I'm not going to go through all the gears for making it. But let me show you what it looks like in action here, and then I'll give you a little more detail about the design of this fixture so that you can replicate it if you're so inclined. The main feature of this jig is a quarter inch beading bit chucked into my MLCS Powerlift Pro router and set precisely to height so that it centers that radius up on the edge of these pieces. And with everything set up and dialed in, it takes only seconds to safely put a perfect profile on the edge of these thin slats. And I wanted to show you this in operation before I go into an explanation to point out the three challenges that need to be overcome to be successful making 81 louvers for those panels. And the first one is to get that thumbnail profile centered up on this slat. If the router bit is set a little too high or too low, the profile isn't symmetrical. It leans to one side or the other. The second challenge is that the slats need to end up at the exact right width. At the same time, I'm making the profile match the contour of the slot in these pieces. And the third challenge, which is probably the biggest one, is producing a video that clearly shows the process. So to overcome the first challenge of getting the bit height set correctly, I'll tell you that the Powerlift Pro app played an integral part in getting that profile set right because of its capability of micro adjusting for height, which in this case involved increments of plus or minus a thousandth of an inch to get that profile dialed in like it needs to be. Because raising and lowering the bit in those small increments allow me to dial in that profile so that it's perfectly balanced in the thickness of the louver slat. After accomplishing the first challenge of positioning of the thumbnail profile on the slat to achieve the second challenge, which is making the slat the right width, I decided to put the profile on one edge of all these slats. Now these slats are about an inch and a half wide. The finished louver is going to be about an inch and a quarter wide. 
and by putting the thumbnail profile on one edge of all the pieces before ripping them to final width. I take out one more step where a combination of error can creep in. So I'm going to do that next. And it's inevitable that this affects challenge number three, which is producing a video that communicates this process. Because I want to run the first thumbnail profile before I take this jig apart and rip these slats. And at that time, I'll show you features of this specially designed fence here that make all this possible. So it's time to fire up the router and profile 100 feet of louver slat edges. To get a smooth chip free profile, I use a high RPM and a medium feed rate with smooth steady pressure and a specially designed push stick to guide each of the slats past the spinning router bit. And because the setup is well designed and efficient to use, it takes surprisingly little time to put a perfect thumbnail profile on about 100 lineal feet of louver slat edges. And with under 15 minutes effort, I've got a whole stack of slats with a perfect thumbnail profile on one edge that fits, well, I'd call it acceptable, into the mortises burned by the laser. So that now the next step is to rip these slats to width and profile the other edge for a perfect fit in those mortises. I programmed the laser to make these mortises an inch and a quarter wide and they measure out just a skosh more than that. I assume it's because of the burning process from the laser itself. So I need to rip the slats down just a little bit wider than that dimension. So when I put the profile edge on there, they end up as a snug fit and not a loose fit. And the setup and sequence that I end up using here is a little bit frustrating because if I had it to do over again, I would have secured this fence directly to the tabletop, not involving the rip fence because I've got a separate the two so I can rip these slats and then come back and reset it up to put the profile on the opposite edge, which is part of the difficulty number three of producing a video for this. But I'll take advantage of the disadvantage when I separate these fences so you can see how I designed and made this dedicated fence for running that thumbnail profile. Because my unifence floats on this end, I use a clamp to hold the fixture down during operation. And I use two stubby wood screws to hold the auxiliary fence to the unifence. So I need to undo those to free up the fence for ripping as well. But with those removed, you can see the fence that I made here to make running that thumbnail profile accurate and efficient. And I put pencil marks down here for repositioning the two fences after I'm done with the ripping process. But let me show you a close up of this little auxiliary fence in case you're inclined to replicate this process. As you might imagine, the most critical part of this whole setup is the height of this quarter inch beading bit because the center of the cut needs to be lined up with the center of this piece to make everything work out. And I'm thankful that I don't have to change that setting. Although if I did, the Powerlift Pro has a repeat height setting feature so I could dial it back in if I needed to. But to run a smooth profile, I need to make sure this piece is secured and set in the right position which is where this auxiliary fence comes in. And I started out by just joining two pieces of this HDF together and then using the drill press to drill an inch and a half hole down through there that's kind of centered up on that bit. And this hole provides chip clearance and the L-shaped fence allows me to secure it to the rip fence for accurate, easy use. The other feature that I built in here is a rabbit in the bottom of the fence that's set to the exact height or exact thickness of these slats so that they slide smoothly through here but they don't move up and down so there's no chatter involved. And all I did there was just cut a rabbit on the table saw. That's the exact height of the thickness of these slats and then it's just about a quarter inch deep. That amount isn't critical because I use the rip fence to set the position of this so that the edge of the slat lines up with the bottom of that beading bit. And you can see that if I put the steel ruler in here, there's a position where the edge of the piece comes tangent with the bottom of that groove in the router bit. And I just want that to line up with the rabbit in this fence. And like I said, this is pretty tricky to show in the video, although the principle is pretty simple. If you take an underside look at this, 
when there's a square edge on the piece, this just slides through here. Slides through like that. So the router bit puts this little thumbnail profile on the edge as the piece passes through under this little fence. So as long as this edge of the fixture lines up with the tangent point on that beading bit, the profile comes out perfect without a flat spot in the middle and without taking off any extra width to speak of. In the setup I have here, this shaves off about two thousandths of an inch as the piece goes through, but that's going to vary from setup to setup. And naturally, everybody's equipment and setup is going to be different. There'll never be another louver project just like this, so I don't offer plans for this setup because it's only going to apply to one place in the universe at one particular time. But I hope you can see the principles that are in play here. So if you want to put a thumbnail profile on the edge of some narrow slats, this little segment will act as a guide through uncharted territory. But with all that said, the next step is to rip these pieces to width and then profile the other edge for a perfect fit. And a setting of just a skosh over an inch and a quarter makes the rough slats just ever so slightly wider than the size I need for the finished slat with a thumbnail profile. And once I'm convinced the fit is cromulent, I run each piece through my debigulator to quickly make all of them the same width. I ended up with 91 slat pieces after culling through. Some of the pieces uh, went bad in the process, but now that they're ripped to width for that final pass of the profile, I can put this fence back on here. This little guy, and uh, just use the same holes as before. And then slide it into place, lining up marks I had before. This will be good within a couple thousandths of an inch. And we can take one of my pattern pieces and slide it through and just make sure that it's uh, not cutting any more or any less. And because these slats are just slightly wider than they need to be, I actually need to set this up so it takes just the slightest amount of width, like a couple thousandths of an inch. There I go using that term again. But as it is, it shouldn't be taking anything off of here. I'll, I'll give it a test at that. And all I'm doing is just sliding the fence till the bit fits here. And this really isn't that tough. I can just move these pieces back and forth here. I can see it's scraping just a little bit there. But it would be easier if I would have attached this fence directly to the table or if I had a dedicated router table for this setup. But I'm happy with that for a test run here. So I use a clamp on the far end of the fence to hold everything down and in place. And now I can give this a test run to see if uh, how it fits in here for overall width. And I have to say that I am more than pleased with the fit I'm getting on that initial pass. See on the back side how tight that fits in there. And I think you'll agree in this macro shot that that fit is just about as good as it gets. And that using a laser for mortises is tough to beat as well. So I can fire up the router lift and confidently run the thumbnail profile on the second edge of all 91 pieces and carefully stack them up until it's time to cut them to length. The next step in final prep before dry fitting is to use a 1 16th inch radius roundover bit in a Bosch Colt router to ease edges on all of the louver mortise strips because it won't be possible once the louver slats are inserted. After easing sharp corners, I sand the strips with 150 grit sandpaper on a hard sanding block for the same reason. Next, I use the router again to ease sharp corners on the inside opening on both faces of the louver frames and use a fine file to finish the radius into sharp corners as a next level detail for the finished frames. After finishing edge prep on the frames and the mortise strips, I was able to start dry fitting these louver frames and as you can see, I've completed dry fit of two of them and I learned some valuable tips and tricks along the way. So I'll share those with you as I walk through the steps and dry fit this third of three frames. The first thing is to make sure the bridle joints on the corners have a snug but smooth fit so that they don't fight me during final glue up. And to achieve that fit, I use the file with a safe back on it 
to kind of clean up the roughness on the mortises and tenons to allow just a little extra room for a smooth fit after glue is applied and clamps are put in place. The next thing is to gang cut the louver slats themselves so that they have an adequate but loose fit between the sides of the frames and a good sixteenth of an inch is just about the right amount and for these frames that number is twelve and five eighths. I need twenty seven of these strips so I tape them together in bundles of nine so I can gang cut them to the exact same length and I start by trimming a minimum amount off the best end of the slats then mark them for length with a pattern stick and trim the nine other ends in one clean, smooth, steady cut. Now with 27 of those louver slats cut to precisely the same length, I can go about slipping them in to these mortise strips. And if I'm being honest, I've been kind of worried about this moment for the whole build uh, from when I started the design process, just wondering how all this was going to come together. But what I learned on these previous two frames is because these mortise strips are just individual pieces and not part of the actual styles of the frame, what I end up with is a piece that functions basically the same as a, a floating raised panel in a regular cabinet door. And that realization tells me that this process is going to be a whole lot easier than it could be otherwise because I'm able to divide and conquer the final glue up process. And with the snug fit that I got with all these slats and these mortises, a whole lot less glue is necessary. But with all that said, it still is a bit of a trick to get these things assembled lined up and both ends of each of these slats slipped into their mortises on the strips. But I'll run the camera while I'm putting this together so you can see what it looks like. My goal as I complete this step is to make sure all the slats are flush with the back side of the first mortise strip. And once there's a slat in every mortise, I start the tricky process of aligning the opposite end of the slats in the other mortise strip, which is just about as tricky as it looks. And this point is no different from the point in every project. As I struggle to line up these strips, I kick myself for making the tolerances of these small parts so tight that this part is a fight. But with persistence, I'm successful eventually in accomplishing a fit where one end of the slats is flush with the mortise strip, but a little short of being flush on the opposite mortise strip. And that bit of play allows me to get a tight fit of this louver panel within the frame. And by using a rubber mallet to drive both sides of the frame together, I adjust the width of the louvered panel to the exact right width that's required to fit inside this frame. So all that's left to complete the dry fit is to slip the blank spacer pieces into the dados in the rails in the top and bottom of the panels. And I'm going to call that a win. Dry fitting on any project with joinery is an important step and because there's enough going on with these frames, I'm actually going to do the glue up in two stages to make sure I don't paint myself into a corner and end up losing the fight with alignment that's impossible to fix after glue dries. So on each of the three frames, I just pop the dry fit apart and quickly sand internal edges with 150 grit sandpaper on a stiff sanding block to make sanding of the final assembly later easier. Then I take frame parts over to my messy bench where I clamp one of the styles in the bench habit to simplify glue up and assembly of this frame. I'm using Type Bond 3 glue to hold everything together and I apply it using a silicone brush and a popsicle stick to make sure all the surfaces of the bridle joint slot and tenon are thoroughly covered before slipping the first two of the four bridle joints together. Next, I clean up excess glue and dry fit the opposite style onto the opposite tenons before using clamps to squeeze everything together. And using this two-stage glue-up process assures me that the frame will be perfectly square and strong enough that I can slide the louvered panels into place and make final adjustments of the position of that panel before gluing up the second style after this first stage glue-up is dried. And no glue-up is complete without using a handful of guy glitter to soak up excess glue and clean it out of difficult areas before it dries. And after excess glue is cleaned up and everything's in place, I finish up with two clamps on the faces of the bridle joints to tighten up the joint for looks and strength. Then add a timestamp to the frame and set it aside with the others to dry. After letting the glue dry on these frames for a couple hours, I kind of feel like I can see the end of the runway. 
and I can bring this project in for a landing because I can glue up the final side of this. And I spent some of the time making a frame that these three panels will go into when they're done. And if you look there in the background, I also glued up the first two of the three panels to get a little experience in doing this because I do have a reputation to uphold. And I want to make it look like I kind of know what I'm doing here. So I can take this over to the bench and show you what it looks like gluing in the louvered panel into this frame. And gluing up these laser louver panels is not unlike gluing up a cabinet door with a, with a raised panel and that there's some things I kind of got to pay attention to along the way. And one of them on this is that I need to make sure I have the top of the louver lined up with the top of the frame. And I need to deal with a little extra space on the top and the bottom of this frame. I built it into the design so that I could even everything out. I don't want a super tight fit when it's all said and done. So after dropping the louver into place, I fit the two blank fillers in the top and the bottom of the frame. So I can use those for centering up the louvers in the opening. And it's a little bit of a struggle to get those guys in there. But when it's all said and done, everything's in place. And I can just double check that second style just to make sure everything's going to work. And one of the key things I learned in gluing up the other two frames was to use some shims to center this up in here. Which is easy enough when there's no glue involved. And I need to shift the panel a little bit that way. And it takes a bit of fiddling, but that's how I want it to end up when it's glued. So I'm just ship, slipping these shims in here to keep that from moving around when I put this piece in place. And that's going to be just fine. So it's time to butter up this piece and slide it into place. So here again I use a silicone brush and a popsicle stick to coat all the surfaces of the bridle joint slot and tenons to ensure solid sturdy joints when the glue up is complete. And then I can slip the piece into place, knowing everything fits because I just dry fit it again. And that's about what I'm looking for right there. Make sure all my spacers are still good there. And then I can put the clamps to it, starting with the long one to pull the rails into place, followed by two shorter ones to squeeze the styles to the rails, and finally two little ones put pressure on the bridle joints themselves. And after a few frenetic but calculated minutes of clamping and cleanup, the whole assembly is set up nice and clean so that all I need to do now is wait for the glue to dry. Once glue is dried, I quit twiddling my thumbs and fire up a belt sander with a 100 grit belt and carefully sand the bridle joints to remove residual dried glue and flush up the stub ends of mortises and tenons. Note that I use heavy pencil lines as a guide while sanding because they help me see progress that the sander is making. It takes a slow steady hand to balance the belt sander on the edge, but firm pressure and a sharp belt make quick work of this job. After cleaning up all the edges, I clamp the louvered panel down to my saw top and again use pencil marks to guide the sanding process of flushing up the faces at the bridle joint corners. Because the joinery is so tight and accurate, I'm removing little more than glue residue on a pencil mark, so it goes quickly. And if you want insight into pro tips for better belt sanding that I use here, check out the video linked in the upper left corner of your screen, where I go deep into the weeds with pro tips for better belt sanding that you see me using here and now. And that bit of belt sanding effectively wraps up this laser louver build video because it includes everything you need to know to build a standard louvered frame like this using a laser to make mortises for the slats. But for this particular project, I need to do some rabbiting on the styles of these panels so that they all fit flush in this framework. So I'm going to jump into that and then come back with a final shot where the panels all fit flush to wrap up the video. The first step is to set the blade height to exactly half the width of the inch and 3 8 style on a louver frame. Next, I set the fence to the rabbit width for the two side frames and make an initial cut for these rabbits. 
After making initial cuts on the fronts of the side panels and the back of the center panel, I reset the blade height to match the initial cut and reset the fence to exactly half the thickness of these panels and make secondary cuts to finish out these rabbits. And it's at times like this when I've invested so many hours in building a complex project like these laser louvered panels that I most want to avoid the feeling of boredom, which is the feeling you get after cutting a board wrong. <laughs> And thankfully, I avoided feeling bored dumb today because the rabbit cuts came out just like they were supposed to and the louvered panels fit perfectly in their frame. So I can finally wrap up this video by saying, as always, and until next time, thanks for watching. Hey, since you're still here at the end of the end of the end of this video, I'm guessing you're not suffering from boredom and you're not feeling bored dumb. So I want to show you a next level carpentry pro tip because I suspect that at least one of the three viewers that are still watching this video are curious about how I made the small slot in the laser louver fixture fence seen in this video. And if I'm right about either one of those guesses, I can show you how I made this fence by showing you how I just made this fence from a piece of maple scrap in the lasered louver video. The process is the same, regardless of the size of the slot. So, for grins and giggles, I'll make a slot 3 and 5 sixteenths of an inch wide, 15 sixteenths of an inch high, and 1 and 3 sixteenths inches up from the bottom edge of the fence. It's important to start with a piece that's flat and straight. The first step is to cut a piece 1 and 3 sixteenths inches wide for the bottom of the fence, and then I cut a second strip 15 sixteenths of an inch wide off the remaining piece of scrap. Next, I mark the 15 16 inch wide piece at 3 and 5 16 of an inch, cut it to that length on the miter saw, and cut the remaining piece approximately in half. No end of the end of the end viewer is going to be surprised that I use Starbond products for this process, so I spritz the edge of the top piece of the fence with accelerator and apply a strip of medium flexible flavor CA glue on one edge of one of the center blocks, which I line up with the end of the top piece, press it into place, and hold it for 10 seconds for the glue to cure. Next, I place the 3 and 5 16 inch long block on edge against the first glued block and glue the second centerpiece in place. After that, I repeat the accelerating and gluing steps on the bottom strip of the fence and, presto, I have a block with a perfect rectangular opening, 3 and 5 16 of an inch long, 15 16 of an inch wide, at 1 and 3 16 inches up from the bottom edge of a piece of solid maple. If I want to get wild and crazy, I can make the opening centered up in the fence by marking the same distance on both sides of the slot and trimming the block to those marks on the miter saw. And there it is. And because everything went well, I don't feel bored done. But to avoid boredom setting in, I'll thank you for sticking around to the end of the end of the end of the end and catch up with you next time you stop by Next Level Carpentry for a video on YouTube. Thank you.